Welcome everyone to Postpartum in the Raw, where we are talking to real parents, having real conversations in a really raw way. So today's guest is uh, Jackie Norton. Welcome, Jackie. How are you? Hi, I'm doing okay. How are you? I'm doing well. I really just want to thank you for um, for joining us today. Today's episode is going to be um, really centered around some of the more severe outcomes of postpartum or perinatal mood disorders. So Jackie, if you wanted to really, I, I really would like to know before we delve into what actually happened, what was your expectations of what would happen postpartum versus what actually happened? So I expected to be tired. Mm -hmm. I expected to have certain mood swings because I had friends that had babies and cousins and everything. I expected it to not be, um, sorry, I'm trying to think of the word, to not affect my life as much as it did though. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it was maybe just, you know, you have this baby, but the baby overshadows all the bad stuff that could come along with it. Or, you know, um, the whole, like looking back, the whole thing that happened just really took me by surprise because nobody talks about it. And I feel like we're kind of like the first generation to start opening our mouths. And anytime I would, you know, talk about it online, like basically crying for help, I would get like the most odd responses. It's like people didn't want to hear it. And it's like, help a girl. But it was, I was very shocked that it lasted as long as it did. I will say that because I was expecting like possible baby blues and I was expecting it to not be easy because I had seen friends go through it. I had seen other people go through it. So I knew that part. But how that looked for me with my history um, and the stuff that happened to me before having children, I didn't realize how much that would affect me being a parent. I love that you that you brought that up. Um, one of the things that I do talk to a lot of parents um, as a birth doula about is that your pregnancy and postpartum doesn't happen in the silo. Who you were before you embark on this journey is definitely going to inform that. And so if you have some traumas, if you have unhealed traumas or even traumas that you've been working through, um, any form of um, physical or sexual abuse that you may have experienced, those things can come back like a roaring lion during your pregnancy, birth experience, and postpartum. And so I don't know um, if those were your experiences, but I do know that from some clients that I've had, I've seen that really show up in some really intense ways. And so um, I do want to give a trigger warning to everyone that's listening that we are going to be discussing some um, very intense matters on this particular podcast um, along the lines of suicide ideation, self-harm, and, and PTSD. And so um, before we move forward, I just want to let everyone know that. And um, Jackie, I want to just give you the space to, to tell your story. Like, what was your experience? Okay, so with my son, I was living away from family. So I did expect to be alone a lot. Um, I definitely had baby blues, you know, crying, night sweats. I slept in a bed 10 feet away from my son. I was the mom that woke up every five minutes like, is he still alive? Is he still alive? Is he still alive? You know, like all of that stuff, which I feel and I heard was pretty normal for the beginning. Mm -hmm. It carried on as far as depression goes for a long time after that. And with him, my husband was working overnight. So he, when he was off, it was great because I could get up to just pump and go back to bed because he was used to being up at night anyways. But when he was working, it was like, I had no help at all. I was basically like a single parent. And I, even when people came to help, you know, are they helping or do they just want to hold the baby? It's like, I always say, when you offer to help after a mother has a baby, you should be bringing a meal, offering to cook, 
helping her. Like, do you want to hold your kid? Do you want me to hold your kid? Do you want to get a shower? Because that's what I was not getting at all. And, but part of it was a little bit of anxiety. I didn't really want anybody to like be with him. I wanted him to be with me. I remember my husband's birthday was two weeks after we had him and we had people over and everyone wanted to hold him. And I was like in his room crying because I was like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to, what if they make him sick? Like I was just crazed. And I'm sure a lot of first moms do this, but what was different about mine was year one. Okay. I was pumping. Every time I dropped a pump, I didn't realize your hormones fluctuate. So I would be like, fine, 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 kind of depressed, but is this normal depression? Then I'd drop a pump and boom, go nuts. His, the postpartum depression I had with him was more depression. It was more me not wanting to do anything. It was, you know, thoughts that I wasn't good enough, thoughts that, Um, I wasn't being a good enough parent and then COVID hit. So of course everything got shut down. We ended up getting pregnant again because we wanted to have a kid anyway. So I was like, well, if we're going to be locked up, I might as well get pregnant and be locked up and pregnant. So (laughs) I, it continued through that pregnancy. So I wasn't sure if it was the hormones from pregnancy or if it was the postpartum that, and before I had my son, I had had depression and anxiety and I was on medication and I went off cause I was working out and dieting and, you know, I kind of fixed myself in that way. And I was able to, because I didn't have kids. I didn't have, you know, that life where you have two incomes and you're just like living the dream before you have kids. You don't even realize it until after you have kids. So I did have a history of depression and anxiety, and I did have PTSD from a car accident I was in when I was 18, and I almost died, and I um, remember the whole thing, and it's weird because that postpartum, or um, I'm sorry, the PTSD didn't really start, like, when I was 18, it happened, I got pregnant with my son when I was around, like, 33, I believe. And the PTSD from that car accident started off right away with like, I'm afraid to be in a car or don't drive fast with me or down certain roads. I would like kind of freak out. Then it went away. And then it came back as panic attacks and Mm -hmm. anxiety and like certain lighting would trigger me certain you know tv shows would trigger me they basically the way my psychologist told me was that back in your head you have all of these thoughts and you remember it right but you might not actively remember it but when you hear something smell something something like that you're seeing triggers that a panic attack can come up. Mm -hmm. So I dealt with that before. And then I did all the stuff, the meditation, the yoga, the working out, all the like mental things. Like, you know, I had all my tools. So I thought I'd be ready for this. So fast forward, I'm pregnant with my daughter and it was really bad. We were moving from California to Georgia and we stayed with my mother. My mother had stage four breast cancer at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I was dealing with helping her. I had a toddler because my son was 18 months, almost two years old. And I was living in my parents' house again, which if you've moved out and moved back in is, I love my parents, but you know, it's yeah. intense. <laughs> so I, um, I was just, it was horrible. My husband was constantly away because he's in the film industry. So he was working in Los Angeles a lot. He actually flew out and did a couple months in Hawaii for a show. So he was never there. Actually, both times I was pregnant, my husband wasn't really there because of his job. He just, the first time I was pregnant, he went to Mexico and then he had his overnights. And then this time he, you know, went to Hawaii and then he had to keep flying to Los Angeles to work. And So I didn't have, it wasn't his fault. If he was there, he would have been supportive, but I didn't have his support all the time. It was just me. And I remember at the beginning of this pregnancy, I was like, you know what? I feel like crap. I've been depressed. I'm going to work out, started working out. I'm actually a 
prenatal postpartum trainer certified, but I've never worked in it. So I was like, I'm going to do this whole YouTube thing. And I'm going to, so I started working out. Right. And then I started to black out when I was working out and get mm. busy when I was working out. And I talked to the doctor and they're like, probably shouldn't be doing this. Like back off a little bit because I also had a short cervix. So, and I had that with my son where they put me on bed rest for the last, you know, couple weeks mm-hmm. or not a couple weeks, couple months. Um, with my daughter, it wasn't as bad, but they still had me on the progesterone, which I mean, is another thing. All these hormones could be contributing to, you know, all the depression and everything I had. So I finally get through that pregnancy and I have my daughter and it was very difficult different than the first time I had postpartum depression. When I held her, I was telling people, and this is honestly how I felt, like she completed me, like everything was lifted, everything bad was lifted from me. I felt like I was holding an angel. And not that I didn't love my son, but my depression was so bad, and I'll get to this in like a little bit, that I recently realized and I feel horrible, but you know, I don't want to go back and you can't go back, you know? So I didn't have these same feelings for him because of the depression and anxiety that I had with him and how that overcame my head so much. So, um, holding her in my arms, you know, thinking she's my twin flame, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then we moved to Georgia finally and everything just kind of went nuts. I'd be fine one day. Like we are now talking, chatting fine. The next day I would be horrible, like not wanting to get out of bed or rage. And I'm talking rage, like wanting to throw things out of nowhere like that. I, you know, I, I mean, I would cry all the time. I didn't get the baby blues with her. Like I did with my son completely different. Like I did not get the baby blues. And I was like, I'm not depressed this time. This is just hormones. You know, this is just hormones. So was there a switch? Cause I, I, I want you to lean into to that piece mm-hmm. because you had a very clear baby blues experience with your son. Mm-hmm. You had a very clear, no baby blues experience with your daughter, but then you're talking about this this switch on different days where you're raging where you're feeling really intense um what was what do you think was happening there what do you now know was happening there was it hormonally based um no i believe it was from my ptsd and everything happening here so we got here my husband wasn't working we were low on money i was already worried about that and we weren't sleeping with my second she was not sleeping a lot at all i was pumping all through the night still i um i would say about two months in is when i started to feel that and then when my husband started to work and i was all by myself it got really bad Like that's when, you know, I'd be fine. I'd be fine. And then I'd have these moments of pure either rage where I would literally have to run from my kids. Cause I was like, I am going to do something that I don't want to do. Cause I had a toddler at the time too. Right. So he's acting out, my daughter's crying and I'm just like, I would literally run. And I remember he would be banging on the door and I'd just be shaking because I, you know, I didn't know how else to control myself. And there were moments and this, my psychologist told me this was from my PTSD because a lot with PTSD is having control issues. That's how it comes out in a lot of people. So when you can't control something, you go to harming yourself because you can control that you control the pain. Mm -hmm. And that's where this like kind of ties in with it. So I would have moments of hurting myself. And it was like, not even like, I wouldn't even think about it. It would just be like, boom. And it would just happen. Like I'm talking, like I'd have bruises on my forehead. I would grab my face and you could see like finger marks on me. Um, I would pull my hair out. I, I mean, it was a lot of stuff. And I remember the one night my son wouldn't go to bed, which is normal. He was two and a half, I think, at the time. And 
I didn't want him to see what I was doing, but I went into one of those modes and he has the bars on his bed, you know, cause he's in a big boy bed, but we mm-hmm. put up the bars and I pushed my head so far, like so hard on the bar that I had a bruise and like a goose mm-hmm. egg the next day on my head. And my husband was like, this needs to stop. Like you need to see somebody, but I was like, okay, so fine. So I got a therapist. Okay. And we talked about all of it and talking. Yeah. Okay, cool. I still didn't want to go on medicine. Cause I was like, I'm going to be a warrior with this, which <laughs> seems very silly to me right now, but cause medicine is a tool too, right? Sometimes yeah. you can do it on your own. So after the waves of this, you know, some days would be grand. Other days would be horrible and I would just cry and cry like I couldn't do it some days and then some days I was super mom you know I always did everything I had to do I always did everything I had to do but some days I was in tears and literally dragging my feet across the floor to get anything done so my mental breakdown after this Um, my daughter was had just turned one Mm -hmm. and my son got the stomach flu and that triggered me. And I didn't even realize, I mean, my whole life I've been like scared of throwing up because who likes to do that? But like, I didn't connect anything and I'll explain like kind of my whole thing after this. But so he got the stomach flu and threw up and I froze like he threw Mm -hmm. up before and I was fine, but I was so you know, all my emotions and hormones were so crazy at the time that I just froze and couldn't do anything. And then I was afraid of my children. Like, no joke, they would come up to me and I would jump like that. Mm-hmm. Like it was a spider coming at me or something, you know, that you're, you want to back away from. And I was just shaking nonstop. And I had an emergency session with my psychologist and she diagnosed that I had a mental breakdown because it had been actually, it wasn't an emergency session. I tried to get one, but that happened on a Wednesday and I went through till the next Monday till I could talk to her and I was still pumping. So I was afraid to take anything for it. I did have Xanax, but I was like, I'm still pumping. Like I can't give that to my baby. So, and that was my whole thing with not wanting to take medication before too. Right. I'm like, I want it as pure as possible. Blah. Even though, and then the only safe drug they say to take on all this is Zoloft, which is what I was on before that made me a zombie. So I really didn't want to be on that. Mm -hmm. And they tried to offer me something when I was in the hospital with my daughter, it was an allergy pill that they kind of use like a Xanax whenever you're pregnant. Um, but I didn't want that either. Cause I was like, you know, I just would rather try to deal with it on my own, even though I'm seeing signs of my son now that I think it would have been better off me being on medication. But my psychiatrist or psychologist told me, you know, you experienced trauma, you had PTSD, you've been going through a lot of stuff, Jackie, you're having a mental breakdown. Is there any way that you can get a psychiatrist appointment like today or tomorrow? Or she said she didn't want me to go to the ER because when the ER is involved and there's suicidal ideation involved, which I would think of every way, like this was even that part and the, and with my son and my daughter, that was the same. I would have Mm -hmm. constant thoughts of they'd be better off without me. Like I'm so much of a hassle to everybody. The world would, I was like, you know, my husband might like be upset for a little bit, but he'll find somebody new. It was my kids that kept me here, honestly, because I didn't want them to be without a mother. And that was the stubborn, that was literally the only thing in my mind that kept me here. And I almost held resentment towards them because of that. I was like, this would be so much easier if I wasn't here. And I have these kids now and I have to be responsible for them. And if I leave them, they're just going to be so messed up. And that's so unfair to them. And I was, I was pissed. Like, I'm not going to lie. And I, you know, after talking to my psychologist and we broke everything down, I actually did find a psychiatrist to see me the next day. Thank God. She didn't want me to go to the ER. That's where I was at Mm -hmm. because she didn't believe I was 
harm going to be harmful to my children. And I guess if you go to the ER in Georgia, um, CPS automatically gets involved if you have suicidal ideation and she didn't want that whole CPS thing to have to happen to me. So thankfully I found a psychiatrist and she got me started on antidepressants and something to calm me down right away. Mm -hmm. But it is still a healing process every day. And what's insane about this is you hear, what people don't tell you is you have trauma from your past. Sometimes you don't even realize it's trauma. Like yeah. for instance, this is what happened to me, the whole throw up thing, okay? So originally my therapist was like, oh, it's a lack of control. You know, that makes sense with your PTSD. Breaking it down more. When I was eight years old, my mother was sick. Okay. She had a mental breakdown herself. Actually. I remember making myself throw up or, um, going to school and pretending to throw up so I could get back home to be with her. Cause I didn't want to leave her side. And uh -huh. so they connected that with why I'm so triggered by it now. And it's like, I thought that was something I did when I was a little kid. Like, how is that now? But you hold everything in your subconscious. You hold everything in your subconscious and it comes up. And my mother was sick a lot. She was sick. I mean, I'm telling you, she had, you know, the mental breakdown, then a stroke when I was 12. And then she had cancer when I was like 15. And then she had to go to the hospital for something else. I can't exactly remember what it was. When I was 18, my graduation night, she had to go to the hospital. Then she almost died coming out of a surgery and then she had cancer. So like my whole life, I had this stuff and we're breaking it down and we realized that's trauma. Like that is trauma. It doesn't have to be like the cra not crazy. I don't want to say crazy, but the usual things you think of, like you think of, you know, sexual abuse or <laughs> you know, abuse, like physically as that's like childhood trauma. It doesn't have to be that. And it's, it was just crazy to me when I broke it down. So that's kind of the whole deal with everything as far as the postpartum was concerned. If you want me to elaborate on anything though, I certainly can. Well, I, you know, how far out are you from your second postpartum experience? 18 months. 18 months. And so once um, you were able to get on those antidepressants, you had action plan, you had a support system, um, how did that actually impact what you were experiencing or how long did you have to wait to kind of see improvement or, or help in that? So in that the area? cool thing about all that is I had had a mother's retreat planned months, months, like, like in June and my mental breakdown happened in like October, November, mm -hmm. and it was in November. So I'm talking to my therapist and my psychiatrist. And I was like, should I even go? It's this weekend, like literally the week I started my meds. And they were like, absolutely. Your safe place is not your home right now. And you need to get away and you need to be around other mothers and you need to have this support and you need to go work on yourself. Absolutely. So I kind of did have almost an intake, if you will, like it wasn't for that, but it helped me clear my mind. It was like, a gift like, you know, I never knew I needed. But when I got back, it wasn't over. You know, mm -hmm. I still had a lot to work on. I work daily at this. Like, for instance, the other day, I thought my son was going to throw up. Now, let me tell you, I've been working on this. It sounds so silly. Before he would spit up all over me. He's thrown up at the park. He's thrown up in the car. You know, none of this ever bothered me. All of a sudden, when he felt that way, and in my head, I already have the tools, right? Like breathe, you know, you're thinking of the like triggers already. Oh, this is a trigger. You're fine, Jackie. You are safe. Like telling yourself that my whole body got hot and I felt like I was going to pass out. And I was like, all this work, I'm still working. I still work every day on this. And I still talk to, I have a psychiatrist appointment on Wednesday. Uh, they were playing with my meds. I'm on, I'll, I, I don't know if you mind, but I'm on, um, Celexa and Klonopin right now. And 
I've been thinking of going off the Kalanapin, but I'm very scared of that because it has been helping me a lot. And it's my like, you know, crutch. Like it makes things not seem as bad, even with the Celexa. Like I'm happier. It took me a little bit. It actually like I had like a high at first, you know, so I was good, but my mom still had to come right after that retreat because my husband was leaving for a work trip right after and she took care of the kids and I had to stay in my room. Like I still had to rest. And this is, I believe a mix of, you know, my mental breakdown was postpartum depression. It was past trauma. It was my PTSD and it was burnout. Like really bad burnout. And I always tell people, ask for help and do not be stubborn. Tell them exactly what you need. Don't just ask for the help. So, because there's a whole group of people out there that um, are on antidepressants, they're on these different, um, maybe anti, whatever, anxiety meds, whatever it is, for whatever their challenges have been, and they're looking to become parents. Knowing what you know now and having experienced what you've experienced, what advice would you give to them about how to really, like, truly prepare? Because you can have the yoga, you can have the meditation. At the end of the day, when you are a person that's dealing with <clears throat> a body that that needs support medically, mm-hmm. that's great. That might feel good. Okay. But what is some really practical support? Because there's a lot of shame. There's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of hard decisions that people have to make um, in regards to how it's going to affect their baby, how it's going to affect their pregnancy, how it's going to affect their minds. You guys have a lot of hard decisions to make about how to handle those kind of things during pregnancy and then even postpartum during breastfeeding. So outside of just like tell people what you need, what would be like some really grounded advice for folks that are already on those medications and are looking forward to starting a family? What, what would you tell them? I would say weigh your options. If you want to go off of it and try that and you start to feel a certain way, do not hesitate to go back on or to go on whatever they suggest. Don't torture yourself. And to add to this, after I went on my medication and I started doing, you know, better, I had this moment with my son and I, you know, TMI, I was in the bathroom, but toddlers butt in all the time. He had to come in and tell me something. I don't even remember what he said, but my heart, I literally felt like the Grinch where it just like grew and grew and grew. And I teared up and I was like, this is the love I'm supposed to feel for my son. This is the love I'm supposed to feel for my children. And he's three. He's three. Do not do not miss out on all of those sweet moments to be stubborn. If you need the tool and it's medication, take the medication. Mm-hmm. Trust me, take it. Because it is, I feel like I mentally missed a lot of the precious moments and I look back and I you know see them and I don't see them as so bad but for my son especially I just feel like mentally I could have been so much better for him and ask every question you can just ask every question you can and do what you feel is best for you but if they're telling you it's safe then and you need it take it. Like, please just take it because I was tortured for a very long time. And I have a very supportive partner that could have walked away a lot because of my stubbornness and unwillingness to take my advice I'm giving you right now. Yeah. So how important, because you mentioned like the, the culmination and I always am going to preach about community, right? You can choose who the people are in your life that can support you. It doesn't always have to be family. Sometimes it could be hiring nannies or doulas, or it could be a cousin, it could be a best friend. But when you spoke about um, how refreshing and useful going to that mom's retreat was, 
I feel like a part of that is because like you were in a safe space, you felt seen and you were surrounded right like we're humans we need connection with other people just because we're parents honestly i don't think our children always count for connection they don't for me mm-hmm. there's a lot of times where i just crave to have adult interaction and and time with other adults and so um now that you're you're moving through this and you understand um, some of the challenges that you're dealing with or have dealt with, how important is, like you said, speaking up and making sure that people support you in the way that you need, how important is community in your life right now as you're still healing through this process? It's the most important thing that I have. I have, I was on, <clears throat> not to, I was on a certain mother's app and I met amazing women who is how, like how I found out about the retreat and we all met on the retreat too together and without them. Mm -hmm. And my mother changed a lot too, because my mother ended up seeing herself in me. So she was a lot more supportive after, unfortunately, after I had my mental breakdown, but like, it is like, you got to find your people. And the app I was on, I don't know so much now because I'm not on it as much. It was great for community and it had a lot of like talk to people and don't Mm -hmm. feel like if they tell you you're not a burden, you're not a burden. Talk to them because Mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't share our feelings because you feel like you're being a burden, you know? And I mean, I'll tell you right now, you could talk my ear off and no one's ever a burden to me. I say that all the time, you know, on my podcast, like you're never a burden to me because we all just need to be heard, you know? Absolutely. And I, I love that. And I think, you know, there's opportunity there sometimes when we have these experiences for intergenerational healing to take place. Because, I mean, I don't know how old you are, but I'm a, I guess, an older millennial. I'm 40. And so um, we are speaking up more. But our parents' generation didn't always have that opportunity. And they had so much pressure to put on these fronts and maintain all this crap. And they suffered and we suffered because of it. And so, you know, even if it is, and I feel like with moms in particular, watching your daughter become a mother and have challenges or have positive things, it does something. It, it, it really can be healing if you allow it to be. And so I love that. Unfortunately, it took your experience with a mental breakdown, but I do think that it's amazing that then your mom had a chance to kind of shift and pivot in her relationship or how she relates to you um, and maybe give herself some more grace in the way that she showed up in your childhood and, and all of that. Like there's always these opportunities for growth in everyone, even when one person is having like this really challenging um, relationship. And I think that that is amazing that you've, you've seen those shifts that you also have community online. Um, you mentioned that you have your podcast and, and you have these these raw conversations around parenting and a lot of your experiences. I would love for you to share. Um, just take a minute or so to kind of share about that and anything else that you would like to share before we wrap up. Yeah. I have a podcast called The Mama Jack, and it's just about real raw parenting experiences. Um, I shared my postpartum depression. I go into a lot more detail with it. I describe, you know, what it is to people because sometimes people don't even realize that that's what they have, you know? Um, We talk about all parenting stuff. There's NICU. There's, you know, adoption. There's teenage pregnancy, like all across the board. And it's all very raw and honest. I ask my people to be vulnerable and I make the platform, unless it's an episode about me, about them because I want them to be heard in their story. So this, me being on here is like, I feel like we're like, you know, go right next to each other because it's so important to give people a voice, not only for them, but for the people that feel like they can't talk about it, 
And that's what my podcast is all about. It's about sharing your honest journey because it's not always bad. Like if being a parent was really, really, really that horrible, no one would have kids anymore. They'd all stop at once. So there's a reason people have kids, but you know, there are tough times and there are tough things to get through. And I think having the support, even just listening to somebody else's story, even if it isn't exactly the same as yours, but similar, just makes it, makes you feel better. It makes it like, you're not alone. I felt so alone a lot of the time. And I, that's the reason I started this was because I needed somebody to be like, listen, I was in hell too. Like I was in hell. Like screw these moms that are like, oh my God, everything's great. Yeah. Yay. And they put on this front. I was in hell. It's not hell all the time, but it can be. And so that is the gist of my podcast is just getting all those parenting situations and putting them out there and hopefully somebody can relate to them. I love that. And, and we need it. You're right. Like we all have a story to tell. Um, sometimes people are faking the funk and sometimes people just can't relate because humans are not, you know, monolithic. We all have very different experiences and, different seasons in life every birth experience every postpartum experience is different and so um with that thank you so much for joining us and sharing um raw and vulnerable i really do purpose to create a space where people can just show up as they are share what they're comfortable sharing and so whenever that happens i don't take that for granted i'm always um deeply in gratitude for vulnerability um and rawness and that people feel safe so thank you jackie for joining us and thank you so much yes we will talk soon okay